Good morning, everyone. We have a glimpse of eternity where we taste something of eternity, and that is our family that we have and knowing Him. That is our eternal treasures, treasures that we have on this earth. And we need to seek Him. We have to invest our hearts in Him. And um, because nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. It is. It is all about Him. He is the author of our life. He's the author and finisher of our faith. And we want to know you, Jesus. My heart is to know him. You know, when we read about Paul, he had all the knowledge, all the spiritual knowledge. He knew the law. He knew all the mysticism of the Judaistic um, Judaism. He knew all that. And he was a teacher amongst teachers. He was a Pharisee amongst the Pharisee. But when he met Jesus, he says he he considers that as nothing. And his heart was always to know the Lord. To know the fullness of who he is. He says to come to the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God. That was his heart. Not to be caught up in spiritual things, but to know Jesus. And that should be our heart as well. Sometimes the simplicity of Christ is a stumbling block for us. We want to know more. There's nothing else. Everything that God wants us to know is revealed in and through his son. Each and every word that the father wants us to live by was revealed in the Gospels through His Son. And they are simple. For some, it is too simple. But let us be as children and receive these words and live by them. Because these words are the words that God wants us to live by. When Moses went up the mountain, not Moses, when Jesus took the disciples up the mountain and they saw in front of them In front of them, Jesus being transformed into the glory shone from him. And in front of him uh, appeared Moses and Elijah. And Peter said, let us build three booths, three churches, three institutions, three whatever. And God spoke out of heaven, this is my son. Listen to his words. Not Moses, not the prophets. They are fulfilled. Because Jesus is the sole expression, the full radiant glory of who the Father is. You want to know who God is? It is revealed in and through Jesus. Get to know him. Let your heart be set on him. Amen. Amen. I want to speak about this morning the fear of the Lord. The reverential fear. The Lord. When we read through the books of wisdom, Job and Psalm and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon, there, are one, there is one verse that's the foundation of all these books. And you find it in Job, you find it in Psalm, you find it in Proverbs. It's a simple truth by which Enoch. Noah and the patriarchs, Melchizedek, live by. These men did not have a Bible to live by, but they had this single verse to live by. And that, that verse is the reverential fear and worship of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That is the foundation. If you read through Job, Job 28, we can go there. It's a simple verse. Because we can be 
get busy with religious acts and religious things. But if the fear, if the love of the Lord, when the love for the Lord is not in our hearts, it is nothing. Twenty-eight, verse twenty-eight. It says, "And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding." And you can read it in Psalm 110, 111. We can go there. Verse 10. It's a very simple scripture. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do this commandment. His praise endureth forever. Very simple. Very simple. This holy fear and reverence that they had for the Lord defined their life. They loved the Lord above all things. Above their wealth. They understood all they had was because of him. They never asked him for riches. They loved the Lord and, the, and God blessed them. God gave them. Because their hearts were sold out. They loved the Lord with all that they had. That is why when everything was taken from Job, he did not curse God. You see, if we, you have Proverbs, and Proverbs is a good discipline, good practice to live by. But if the foundation of the reverential fear is not there, wisdom can only carry you so far. Because if Job did not have this reverential fear of the Lord in his heart, wisdom would not have carried him. His friends were some of the wisest men that they were. And they gave him all the advice in all the world. But it was not enough. It was his fear and his love for the Lord that carried him. And so we can live, we see in the world people living by Proverbs, the, the principles of the Bible. But if the foundation is not set there, and the foundation is this, the beginning of wisdom, that beginning is the foundation of wisdom. If the foundation to fear the Lord and to conduct your life in such a way, Wisdom will not carry you. All the words in the world will not comfort you if the foundation for the love of the Lord is not in our heart. We have to set the Lord in His right place within our hearts. Does He have the first place in our heart? Does He have the throne of our heart? Fear of the Lord is the foundation on which all wisdom is built. If you read through the Bible, not even miracles will be able to sustain you. We see this when Israel saw the wonders of God moving in Egypt, splitting the Red Sea before them. This was not enough to sustain them. It was every day. If they, whether there was a shortage in water or food, they doubted the Lord. So not even miracles. How many times when we have had a breakthrough and we saw a miracle in our life, it only sustains us for a week and after that we doubt God again. Or we doubt in His faithfulness, we doubt in His, in His goodness. Because miracles won't sustain us. It is this love for the Lord that will carry us through dark times like it did with Job when everything was taken from him. When his wife said, said to him, curse God and die. Even his wife turned to him. He was alone. That which carried him was his love for the Lord, his obedience, his reverential fear. When Jesus was in the wilderness 
And the devil came and tempted him. All that he had was this reverential fear and this love for his father. To do the will of the father. And we need to come to that place. We are finished with religious things. Finished. It's not good enough. It's not good enough just to come to church and sing songs and say the right thing and act the right way because we know how to put the best foot in front. We know how to put on masks. It's not good enough. It will not sustain you. You will be disappointed. We have to come to a place where is God real in my life? Is he just an archetype in my life? Or is he a reality in my life? Is he the sole purpose of my life? Is he the, the, the first? Is he my first? Is he my last? Is he the center point of my life? Is he a reality? Because when we come to that place, and we, we, we realize God is real. Jesus is real. He is with me. I start to conduct my life in that way. I start to speak that way. I start to act that way. It's not just coming in front of my religious friends where I speak the right way. But I'm living it. This is who I am because I fear the Lord. I regard Him in my life. The book of Proverbs, I want to go there. Proverbs 1. Verse 7. And like I said, in Proverbs, it's a wise book. It's good discipline. If you want to know how to conduct your life, read Proverbs. Read it. But let us, let us first, let's, let's live from this foundation. In verse 7, it says, The reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord is the beginning and the principle, I'm reading from the Amplified, and the principle and choice part of knowledge. Its starting point and its essence. The essence. But fools despise skillful and godly wisdom and instruction and discipline. And it's, it's interesting because um, Solomon starts, before he starts with his, um, his Proverbs, he establishes this foundation in the book. This is, where this, this is where we have to start. This is where we have to jump from, is here. And then we read through to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 12. You can go there if you want. Verse 12, and it says, And further by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books, there is no end. Much study is weariness of the flesh. So it says you can have all the wisdom in the world and you can fill it with books. There are millions of books. And without this understanding of the foundation of wisdom, it is nothing. It is just weariness. You have to have that foundation in place. Then he says in verse 13, let us hear hear the conclusion. So we started in, in Proverbs 1 where he says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Now he comes to his conclusion. And he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. You know, Solomon's life is very interesting. He was a very inquisitive man. If you read through Ecclesiastes, he admits that. He gave himself to knowledge. He sought out all knowledge. And I think his his inquisitiveness led him in in dark paths because he started to worship. He he worshipped the the gods of his wives. And he admits that in Ecclesiastes. And he gave himself 
to all his riches and all the pleasures of life. And then he said, this is all emptiness. And that's why he said this conclusion, fear God. Fear him. This man had everything in life. He achieved everything in life. Had all the wisdom in life. And he said, it's nothing. Fear God. Worship him. Set God apart in your hearts as holy. And sanctify him. Build your life upon him. When I think about this story, when we read Proverbs 1, in the first couple of chapters of Proverbs, Solomon speaks of wisdom as a feminine. He says, and those who search for her, she shall reveal herself to, to them. So he, he speaks of wisdom in the, in the feminine. And when I read that, the passage that sprung up to me in the picture was, Mary Magdalene, when she came in amongst the disciples and Jesus and she broke that alabaster jar of his feet and she was, washed his feet with the oil in her hair. That was the, the picture that I had because that is reverential fear. That is worship. Giving everything. Giving all that she had to Jesus. Because he and he alone is worthy. We can go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26 from verse 7 to 8. And we can just read it. Such a beautiful, beautiful passage. It says, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of precious ointment and poured it out on his head and he, as he sat in meat. But when the disciples saw it, they were in indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? Sometimes in a religious mindset, they find our worship offensive inappropriate this whole setting of a woman a sinful woman coming in amongst men in that time was not wasn't allowed in the culture but what fear and conviction that this woman have had to have to come in there and do what she did He is an utterly sinful woman in the presence of men. Not even to mention the Son of God. Not knowing her place according to the customs and culture of the time. And she was aware of this. The fear of rejection, condemnation, their intimidation and judgment did not withhold her from this act of worship because the Lord was set as holy in our heart because that is what worship is it's not music our, our frame of reference is music and we sing along worship is where my heart is for him my life is for him a couple of weeks ago I said you know, sometimes we give God his due. When we pray, we take off our hats. Or when we sit around the table, we pray for the food. We gave God his due. Now we can go on with our life. That's not worship. That is not worship. That is God being a side dish to your life. God is our life. That's what Jesus said. To know God, this is eternal life. And we seek him above all things. He comes first. Because without him, I'm nothing. I don't have the breath in my lungs. I have nothing. And to live in worship is to have revelation of who he is. And when we see this woman, she gave everything. Her life was changed in a moment. She was completely changed. 
because she loved the Lord. Here in the midst of these, of the disciples, and they were religious leaders of the time. You know, their mindsets were probably, you know, who is the greatest? Lord, who is the greatest? Posturing, you know, for, for Jesus' attention. You know, how, how people are, you know, fighting for attention like orphans. Not knowing who they are and what they are. And here comes a woman and Jesus regards and she, he's teaching, this is what I want, this is what we need, this is what I need. Not fighting and bickering and who is the greatest. Or Jesus told them who is the greatest. He said, he who is the least is the greatest. He who is first shall be last and last shall be first. And we can miss things like that so easily. Because we always want to have God's attention. We always want to be seen. We always want to be, you know, we want to be the one that God uses. And all that God wants is this relationship, this wor- where we can worship him and love each other and love him and pour out our hearts on him as he has poured out his love on us. I love how Christ offends religious mindsets and religious people. That's one of my favorite things. And even sometimes for me, he offends me. His love offends people. I talked about Job. Job was offended. If you read the book of Job, Job was offended because God forgave and God loved. I I love that about Jesus. Because you won't be able to say, put God in a box and say, God can't love him, God can't love her, God can't regard this or that. God won't allow that. He will always offend our mindset if we are in religious mindset. Religious people are constantly fighting and striving for a bigger and greater reward. When Jesus went, he gave the parable of the man that went out early in the marketplace and he saw people out in the early mornings, then midday and then late in the afternoon. And what did he do? He gave them all the same reward. And what what happened? They were offended. You're not going to get a greater prize because it's not about the prize. The prize is knowing him. The prize, he is the prize. Eternal life is the prize. And we, when we start thinking about, you know, houses in heaven and crowns and treasures and all these things, we're not in the right mindset. We are missing the mark. Job showed what the mark is. It's about him. It's not about these things that we gather on earth. It's about him. I want to go back to Mary in, in, in John John 7, John 12, verse 3. It just describes the setting even more in a a, a more beautiful way. It says in verse 3, Then took Mary a a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet wiped his feet with her hair and Jesus no sorry and the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment when I think about this portion when I read this you know I'll act of worship because worship leads to transformation it says in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 it says as we behold him as we set our hearts on him, we are transformed into his image, into his likeness. When I read this, I thought of uh, the scripture that came up to me was First John 3 verse 3 where it says, He who puts his hope, his trust in him is purified as he is pure. When we have, 
when this, this heart of ours is filled with love for the Lord and filled with reverential fear and we, we love the Lord that with all our mind, with all our soul, there's transformation happening. It is like this ointment. You know, you're washing the feet of Jesus, but you are also filled with this perfume. And it fills your, your environment, it fills your house, it fills your family, it fills your... When your life changes, it's not just you that benefit of it. It's everybody around you that benefits of it. And that is the power of our worship. That's the power of this reverential fear that we have for the Lord. It transforms lives. It transforms wherever it goes. I'm going to go to back to Mary again. Um, in um, just, li- I want to talk about her. I believe what she, what she did, convicted the others, exposing their hearts. In a sense, what are we busy with? What are we busy with when we, when we worship the Lord, when we gather here together? Is it just a habit? A cultural habit? Or do we understand what we are doing here? Are we living? It's not just, I spoke about when um, I went to this party and some of my old friends and people were drinking and, and, and doing what they want to do. And when we had to pray for the fruit, then they took off the hats and gave the Lord their due. That doesn't mean anything. Our whole life should be that act of worship, should reflect that. Whatever you do should reflect reverent and worshipful fear unto the Lord. The Bible says, do everything as if unto the Lord. Then we will see the power. Otherwise, it's just, a, just something to do, just a, a mask that we wear. It's nothing. God does not care for that. Hosea 6 verse 6, it says, God seeks mercy. Now in that context, mercy means um, reverential fear or piety. He seeks mercy. He seeks piety and not sacrifice. He does not care for your religious acts. He does not care for your, your religious sacrifice. He seeks a, a heart filled with piety, reverential fear. That's what he seeks. He desires that. It says in Isaiah, I say, these people draw near with their lips, but their hearts are far removed. I've been in that place. We've all been in that place. Say the right thing. You know, oh, you know, you can, can quote scripture, whatever, but your heart, when you out of the door, you know, out by the church gates, you are another person. Or if you're amongst these friends, you're another person. Or, you know, there's no power there. That is what religion is, and God does not want that for us. He seeks relationship with us. He wants to bring us to that closeness with Him. Living in truth. Truth. Being established in the Word. Being established in, in this new creation. That he has made us. Where the old things have passed away and everything is new. That is what he seeks. And sometimes our worship is undignified. Religious people like dignity. Like to be dignified. You cannot be undignified. Everything has to be dignified. What this woman did undignified it offended them it's not about them it's not how they feel or how comfortable they feel it's about pouring your heart out on the Lord it's about him and I'm not talking about dignified in a moral sense we're not talking about that talking about pride pride and ego which people like to conceal as the spirit of self-control it's not self-control it's protecting your ego 
protecting your pride. I want God to resist the proud. God does not care for our pride. Because sometimes it is our pride that stands between us and God. Pride is when I choose myself above God. I choose myself above the truth. And we have to let go of that. Self-control for me is to resist and control the sinful appetites of the flesh like greed, lust, envy, hate, violence, slander, lying. That is self-control. Not for that woman to restrain herself and to act in a dignified manner. You know, when David danced before the, 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 the ark, he was not dignified and it offended his wife. Because she said, what will the people think? She, he did not care. Shall I fear man or shall I fear God? That was his attitude and that should be our attitude as well. We want to worship on our terms as long as our egos and pride remain intact. That is acceptable and appropriate. God does not care for that. He seeks a sincere heart, sincere worship, not the act of worship. He seeks, it's something that I, I always trust the Lord, that my heart will always be sincere towards him. It won't be an act. Her worship was unwelcomed. That's what the disciples thought. But Jesus said this act of worship shall be remembered for all eternity. If we read it in the Bible, it says... It says it in Matthew, but he said that what she did here shall be remembered for all eternity. Because it's a lesson unto us. It's not on our terms and our conditions. We do not set the terms and the conditions. That which she did wasn't a projection to appear reverent. It wasn't. You know, as people, we like to project. We want to always project what we want others to perceive us as. We always want to be seen as more wealthy or more successful, more reverent, more religious. We project that. Our God sees us for what we are. God sees who we are. When you read and look about the tax collector and the Pharisee standing before the Lord, and the word says the tax collector did not even have the boldness to look up, and he stood far, he stood back, and he said, "Lord, have mercy." Have mercy. And the Pharisee said, I'm glad I'm not like this guy. And God had regard for the, 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 the tax collector. What are we busy with? And I have to ask that question for myself sometimes. When I'm alone, what am I busy with? Am I busy with my things? My... Um, my religious things or am I busy with truth is my heart sincere do I love the Lord is the Lord truly the center of my life or is it just something nice or beautiful to say when we go back to Abraham in the 
patriarchs, Job, Melchizedek, this is all they had. They loved the Lord. And they conducted their life in a manner that pleased Him because He is holy. They did not need a law. They did not tell, need people to tell them what is right. They knew God is holy and pure. And they wanted to conduct their life in that way. They loved the Lord. They gave Him everything. And I want to be one of those persons, you know, that truly can say, I, have, I don't want to hold back from the Lord. You are my life. You are life. Because I'm only here for who knows how long. But he will always be there. And I want to know him. Like Paul states, I want to, I want to know and come to the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God. I want to know the fullness of who he is. I want to pour out my life on his feet. I want to pour out my love on him. And it's not a comfortable thing for many people because we still want to live our life and give God his due according to our terms and our conditions. But God does not seek that. Relationship. If you want to dwell in relationship with Lord, we cannot hold back. We have to go in. You cannot love, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot love the world and love God. You have to choose. You know, a lot of us, for me as well, you know, there were times that we, I was busy. I loved the Lord, but I, was, I still wanted to do my things in the world. I still wanted to live the way I wanted to live. God says, there's no power in that. That is, that is not what he seeks. You have to choose. We have to choose. Otherwise, we're just going to be busy with religious things and not with truth. Let go of the world. Other way, let go of the old and we embrace the new and we walk according to the new. And though you will sometimes stand alone because some people will not like it when you take a stand for truth or when, when you take a stand for righteousness, morality, purity. Oh, these are, in today's times, these are unpopular things. These are unpopular. It is, today, it's nothing to live a compromised life. It's, it, it's normal. And as soon as you take a stand for morality and, and, and righteousness and truth you're not going to be favored you're not going to be liked but it's not about like Mary it wasn't about the opinions of the disciples or the religious people it's not about it's about him I want to live pure and righteous because he is pure and righteous I want to give that to him it's not even required. He, does not, he did not even have to tell me. I just want to give it to you because Jesus, you are so holy. You are so pure. I want to worship you. That which defined the old Abraham and Job, it wasn't their possessions. The Bible says they were very wealthy men, rich men. But that did not define them. They were men of God. Loving the Lord. They would give everything for the Lord. There's nothing that had a hold over their hearts. Nothing. Not riches, nothing. They love the Lord. That's it. And this is the duty of man. To fear the Lord. To worship. And to keep his commandments. We want him. We want more of him. If you want more of him. The world should become less. 
the things of the world should become less if you want more of the Lord. More of you, Lord, less of us. And I know it's not an easy word. No, the Lord loves us. He gave everything for us. Because the world led us astray. And Jesus came and he brought us back to our true identity, our true purpose, being sons and daughters of the Most High, reflecting him, not being Christians and reflecting the world, reflecting him, reflecting the light, being the light in dark times, not being part of the dark, but being part of the light, being hope, showing others the way, That is who we, should, who we are supposed to be. And, and I want to be that. And for some, no. They'd rather just have God in his place and we'll just continue with our life. But for me, my conviction is I want to know him. Because I understand that that is life. And it's not going to be comfortable. It's never going to be comfortable. There are very few stories in this book of comfort. God is always pushing us to grow. Always pushing us to grow in stature. When, when Jonah said, no Lord, this is not right. I will not go and preach your word. He was offended because God loved people. God loved these sinful people. God loves sinful people that offend religious people. God loves them. So who has to change? God or us? We have to change. Our heart needs to change. When we read about the prodigal son, when we read about the elder brother, he was offended. In that whole scenario, who had to change? While well, the younger brother repented, came back. The father's heart was unchanged. It was only the religious brother that stayed in the father's house that thought he was self-righteous. He was the one that needed to change. And so let our hearts, let's be open to change. Let's be open to the Lord may be offending us sometimes. Let's be open. Do not let your pride and your egos rob you from God. Let go of your pride. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Those who humble him themselves, he will lift them up. Amen. Let us stand. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, you are busy working in and through us, Lord, and you have purpose in whatever you are, in all that you are doing, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you shake us. Shake us loose from religious things, sinful things, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We want to be we want to be formed and molded into your in the image of your son Jesus Christ not the image of the world not the image of of the old man Lord we want to live in truth live by your truth not just be hearers of the words but live according to the word that the word can man be manifested in and through us Lord I pray Lord that our hearts will be filled with reverential fear and worship for the Lord 
because that will carry us through difficult times, this love that we have for you. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit come and teach us and lead us in all, all truth. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Come, fill us. Lead us, guide us, speak to us, teach, teach us. Mold us into the image of you, of the Son of God. Thank you, Father. We worship you. There is no other. There is no other. And Father, you know we, where each and every person is here today. You know where their hearts are. And I thank you that you meet them where they are. For some, you lead gradually into the waters. And for others, they, we just jump in. You meet us where we are, and you know how to work with each and every person here. There's no standard form for everyone. You know how to work with each heart. You know where you are going with them. You know what you're doing. And we have this promise and this knowing that the work that you have started in us, you will surely finish. I want to honor you, Lord, for every heart that said yes to you. Yes, there are things that we have to let go of. But we said yes, Lord. And we are in that process of living in surrender. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we will get busy with the right things. Like this image of Mary anointing your feet, Lord. That we will not fight for attention or fight to be seen. that we will be busy with the right things, Lord. And knowing that this act of worship, this outpouring, transforms us. And we worship you. Be glorified in and through our life. Thank you. Just take a moment. We get so busy with our things. Let, let us give the Holy Spirit time and the Lord time. Allow him to minister to you. Do not be distracted. Just give him this space. And there, we all know the, the areas in our life where we have to give over or maybe let go habits, decisions. Yeah, we all have these areas where we have to surrender. And today the Lord is saying, you have to choose. Either you say yes and you give it over, you keep it to yourself. But the Lord said, like he said with Moses, Moses said to the Israelites, put before you life and death. I say choose life, but you still have to choose. You have to choose whether you want to surrender those things. God's not going to choose for you. He did not choose 
when Cain killed his brother, he left Cain with the choice. He said, hey, Cain, you have to choose. You have to choose. I will let go of immorality, let go of unrighteousness, let go of sinful, or we hold on to it, or we choose righteousness, we choose holiness, we choose life, which leads to life. And some decisions are very hard to make. They are very difficult to make because I knew there were decisions that I had to make in my life that were very difficult. But you have to know today the choices that we make, we are going to eat the fruit thereof, whether that is life or death. Immorality does not lead to life. Unrighteousness does not lead to life. And Father, today we choose life above all things. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We worship you. Thank you, Father. Church, you should know Despite these difficult decisions that we have to make, the Lord's heart towards you remains unchanged. He said in Romans 8, there's nothing that will ever separate you from the love of God. It's nothing. His heart will never change concerning you. But the decisions that we make, we have to understand, we live by those choices. We live by those, by those decisions that we make. And the Lord, some of our, the things that we do in our life, the Lord does not want for us because it's not going to lead to life. And while we have to make difficult decisions and there might be convictions in your heart, just know today that the Lord's heart towards you remains the same. But that does not mean we must remain the same. It does not mean that we cannot change. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for, the, for attending today. And, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to you. You know, he is our greatest teacher. He is our greatest leader. He will teach and guide you in all truth. Amen. Amen.